questions. We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlow. Uh, presiding officer, with apologies. <laughs> um, <clears throat> That's probably the nicest the SNP benches have been to me in 13 years. Um, last week at First Minister's Questions, the First Minister was in denial about the state of Scottish education. So what's her response to yesterday's call from MSPs from across this chamber for a full inquiry into broad general education and curriculum for excellence? And will she now hold one? First Minister. Hey. The, the Scottish Government will abide by the decision of Parliament yesterday and the Deputy First Minister will set out in due course how that will be taken forward. Of course, I would point out to Jackson Carlow that there was a review of the broad general education carried out by the OECD in 2015. Um, and when it issued its report and made its recommendations, the Scottish Conservatives welcomed it and said that they agreed with its recommendations. Uh, there is already a commitment to ask the OECD to carry out a review of the senior phase, but of course we will abide by uh, the decision that Parliament took uh, yesterday, uh, whether or not uh, we consider that that is necessary. Jackson Carla. Thank you. Can I thank the First Minister for that response? And it, it's important that we have a full inquiry. The majority of MSPs across parties have demanded that, and I'm grateful if she is saying now that her government will respect the uh, will of Parliament. But surely, I hope in so doing, she also accepts, as do the majority of MSPs in this chamber, that there are key weaknesses in key aspects of Scotland's school education and the qualification structure that challenge her government's claim that after 13 years of SNP, Scotland's schools are producing a strong set of results. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say to Jackson Carlow that I welcome his comments, of course, about the will of Parliament, and I hope the Scottish Conservatives will apply uh, that uh, generally uh, to decisions <laughs> of this Parliament. Um, but secondly, it, has, it is not and it has never been the position of uh, me as First Minister, uh, the Deputy First Minister as Education Secretary, or this entire government, that there are not areas of improvement uh, that we require to see happen in Scottish education. That is why we are taking the action that we are taking. It is, of course, why there was that review in 2015 by the OECD into the broad general education and why the Deputy First Minister has instructed a review into the senior phase. But what I did last week and what I will do again today is point to the evidence. Uh, and the evidence, whether we look at performance at level five, whether we look at performance at level six, uh, which of course is higher, so whether we look at performance in terms of the numbers of pupils achieving uh, five hires or more, then all of the evidence says that that performance is improving. Of course, we want to see it improve even further, which is why we will continue uh, with the range of reforms that are underway in Scottish education. Jackson Carla. I mean, let's just remind ourselves of some of the concerns that were raised in yesterday's debate. And over 50% of schools only offer six subjects in S4. National 4, National 5, higher and advanced hires being taught in the same class, the lowest higher and advanced higher results for five years. I mean, these are serious matters and they should command our attention. In saying that the First Minister will respond to the call from Parliament yesterday, does she accept the nature and scope of the inquiry that has to take place beyond simply accepting that there are some things going right in Scottish education, that it has to now focus on the things that are going wrong. Well, First Minister. I, I think if, if you are going to instruct a review, it's important to allow that review to do its work. That's what we did in 2015 with the OECD uh, review on the broad general education, which I think reported early in uh, 2016. Uh, and of course, that is the intention of the review now into the senior phase. But as I said earlier on, uh, the government uh, will come uh, back uh, later to see how we intend to take forward the decision that Parliament took yesterday. Uh, but Jackson Carlaw uh, never really, and I can understand because it doesn't suit his narrative here, he never engages uh, with the facts that I put forward yeah, in the chamber. Uh, so let me just repeat some of them uh, today. Um, in 2006-07, I'm talking about level five here, um, the percentage of school leavers getting a level five qualification uh, was 71.1%. In the most recent year we have statistics for, it was 85.9%. Yep. Uh, looking at hires, uh, when we took office, uh, less than half of pupils left school with a hire. The percentage was 41 
0.6%. Today, uh, almost two-thirds, 62.2% .2 of pupils yeah. leave school with a, a higher. In 2009, uh, the percentage of pupils leaving school uh, with five passes or better was 22.2%. Today, uh, that is more than 30%. So I readily accept uh, that further improvement is required. That's why we're taking the action we're taking. What would be good once in a while would be for Jackson Carlaw to accept the progress that these statistics say is taking place in Scottish education. Jackson Carlaw. The First Minister very often accuses others in this chamber of not just having listened to the answer that she gave. In the question I just put, I began by saying that we accept that there are many things that are right in Scottish education. But I said that Parliament yesterday goes way beyond just wanting to pat ourselves on the back about those issues and feels we now need to deal seriously with the things that are going wrong. And it's the things that are going wrong that this government consistently dismisses, undermines and refuses to engage with. And the suspicion the suspicion from just hearing the answer the First Minister has given is that this review is going to be a whitewash, not a proper investigation into the real problems that exist. So will the First Minister agree and repeat, not just that she's going to consider in due course, but this will be a full inquiry that will deal directly with the issues in which a majority of par this Parliament from all parties other than her own accepted needed to be dealt with as a matter of urgency. First Minister. I think uh, Jackson Carlow needs to be really quite careful here. Now, I'm going to take the positive out of this and perhaps we can uh, get some kind of consensus here because if I heard Jackson Carlow correctly, then I think what he was now conceding is that in terms of the pupils leaving school with national uh, five higher qualifications, five hires or more, then we are seeing progress going very much in the right direction. If Jackson Carlow is now conceding that, then that is indeed progress. I have never stood here and said that there is not a need to look at where further improvement is required. Now, the area where I think Jackson Carlow has to be really careful is in what he said there about whitewash uh, reviews because this government uh, firstly in terms of the 2015 review into the broad general education and curriculum for excellence generally and in the review the deputy first minister has instructed into the senior phase uh, both those reviews in the uh, case of the first one it uh, was and in the case of the second one will be carried out by the OECD yes. now surely Jackson Carlaw is not suggesting in any way shape or form that that will be anything other than an independent and robust review. And in fact, the 2015 one, as I said earlier on, was welcomed by the Scottish Conservatives and they accepted and agreed with its recommendations. The Deputy First Minister will reflect on uh, what Parliament uh, decided yesterday. I've said we will abide by that and come forward with how that will be taken forward. But I think any uh, fair-minded person would look at the reviews that this government has instructed so far and not come to the conclusion that Jackson Carlow has done. There is progress in Scottish education. We want to see that progress continue and accelerate. That's why we will continue to get on with that job. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, last year, the fatal accident inquiry into the death of Alan Marshall found that his death in custody was, and I quote, entirely preventable. A fortnight ago, we learned that Alan's family are now planning to launch a legal action against the Scottish Prison Service, Police Scotland and the Crown Office. Does the First Minister understand the hurt and frustration felt by Alan Marshall's family? And does she accept that justice still has to be delivered? Sir. Uh, well, firstly, uh, can I say, yes, I do uh, understand the hurt and the pain of Alan Marshall's family and indeed any family who face those circumstances. And my uh, deep condolences and thoughts are with them. Uh, in terms of fatal accident inquiries, uh, the government uh, and indeed any agency uh, whose conduct is the subject of a fatal accident inquiry has a duty to learn from any recommendations and that uh, will be uh, in terms of the Scottish Prison Service the case with uh, the FAI into what happened with Alan Marshall. Um, beyond that, and I'm sure uh, Richard Leonard will understand that because he said in his own question, Alan Marshall's family, and they are entirely entitled to do this, have indicated an intention to raise legal proceedings. It would therefore 
therefore not be appropriate for me to go into any more detail right now about the circumstances of that potential uh, legal action. Uh, suffice to say, uh, though, two things that I've already said. Uh, my thoughts remain uh, with his family um, and the lessons uh, that are there in the FOI uh, findings and recommendations uh, have to be taken forward and they will be taken forward. Richard Leonard. Thank you. It's not just Alan Marshall's family who have lost a loved one because of entirely preventable failures. The case of Craig McClelland has been raised with the First Minister a number of times by Labour's Neil Bibby. Craig was murdered in 2017 in an unprovoked knife attack by an offender who had unlawfully removed his electronic tag. His attacker had been on the run for nearly six months. The McClelland family called for a public inquiry, but the government refused. The family sought a fatal accident inquiry, and they supported legislation which would have made fatal accident inquiries mandatory when a murder is committed in these circumstances. But the government voted this down. The Cabinet Secretary for Justice defended his decision, claiming that where the circumstances justify it, the Crown will undertake a death investigation. Well, the McClellan family were told just before Christmas that their request for a fatal accident inquiry had been denied. First Minister, why do the circumstances of Craig McClellan's death not justify an inquiry? First Minister. Um, can I also uh, say, and I have discussed the uh, case of Craig McClelland in this chamber before, I think in response uh, to Jackson Carlow um, and others as well. Uh, again, uh, what happened uh, in that case uh, was dreadful uh, and tragic, uh, and my thoughts and condolences are with his family as well. Uh, a number of lessons uh, have been learned there. Whenever there is a quest for a public inquiry, uh, that is very carefully considered by the government and the reasons for our decisions are set out. And in uh, some cases, of course, uh, public inquiries are instructed. As I hope Richard Leonard knows, decisions on fatal accident inquiries are constitutionally entirely matters for the law officers, uh, for the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General. They are uh, not decisions of the Scottish Government and nor should they be. And therefore it is not appropriate uh, for me to second guess or comment on the decisions that law officers take in that regard. But whether or not there is a, a fatal accident inquiry, it is incumbent on uh, this government to learn any appropriate lessons, and we always endeavour to do that. One example, because legislation uh, has been referred to and the circumstances in that case of, of a tag being removed, the recent legislation that was passed in this parliament, of course, created a new offence of being uh, unlawfully uh, at large. Uh, that was in part uh, a response to some of the, those uh, circumstances. So uh, I absolutely understand uh, the deep uh, distress of families in this situation. If it was a member of my family, uh, I would be in exactly the same position. Uh, the Scottish Government's got a responsibility to respond and to take uh, considered judgments on these matters, and we will always seek to do that. Richard Leonard. Except the separation of powers that exists, but it was a choice taken by this government not to make FIAIs mandatory in cases like those that led to the death of Craig McClelland. And the two process reviews conducted following Craig's tragic death did highlight significant failures in the, in the home detention curfew system. And these failures only strengthened the case for an independent inquiry. Craig McClellan's family have met with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. They have listened to what he has got to say, but they have no confidence that lessons have been learned. Just last month, the Justice Secretary laid before Parliament new regulations on the use of tagging equipment just three days before they were due to come into force. So he breached parliamentary procedure, sidestepped full scrutiny, and so potentially put public safety at risk. First Minister, it is your duty to ensure that the public has confidence in the justice system. The families of Craig McClelland and Alan Marshall 
have been badly let down. They have lost their faith in the system. And if they have no confidence in your justice system, why should anybody else? First Minister. Well, I, I fully uh, understand why a family facing uh, the circumstances uh, that this particular family has faced feel the way they do. Uh, I would be the last person uh, to suggest otherwise. Uh, the government has to make sure that lessons are learned. The, the Justice Secretary has set out uh, to this Parliament the uh, different lessons and steps that have been taken to uh, make changes in a number of these areas as a result of uh, not just this case but other very tragic cases uh, that we have seen. And it is our responsibility which we uh, take very seriously and discharge to make sure that we have have uh, a sound and solid uh, justice system respecting uh, the separation of powers of course that is important in all of these matters and we will continue uh, to do that. Um, in terms of fatal accident inquiries there are some circumstances, deaths in custody for example where fatal accident inquiries are mandatory. Uh, beyond that uh, careful consideration is, uh, is given uh, but it is important that decisions on fatal accident inquiries are for the law officers to take uh, and that they take into account all of the appropriate circumstances. Uh, I'm sure uh, that the Lord Advocate uh, would be uh, more than willing to respond further in this particular case, uh, but it would not be appropriate for me uh, to step into uh, the shoes of the Lord Advocate in terms of the decisions uh, that are taken extremely seriously. But in general terms, uh, the government will always seek uh, to respond carefully, uh, sensitively uh, and appropriately uh, when issues like this arise so that we are learning the right lessons and, where necessary, making the right changes. Thank you. We have some constituency supplementaries. The first from Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Kenneth Gibson. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, last night I attended a meeting with 12 other MSPs and around 50 people, mostly from frontline women's organisations, to discuss women's sex-based rights. We heard from one of my constituents, a retired prison governor, that while the Scottish Prison Service would not contemplate placing a trans man in a male prison, they have fewer qualms about placing a trans woman who is still physically male in a female prison. A risk assessment only takes into account a trans woman's propensity for violence. It does not assess the potential psychological impact on female prisoners, many of whom are extremely vulnerable, having endured years of violence at the hands of male perpetrators. This can and has had serious impacts on the mental well-being and rehabilitation of vulnerable female prisoners. Is it not time, therefore, First Minister, to ensure that people who are physically male are no longer admitted to female-only prisons? First Minister. Uh, well, obviously, I'm not aware of uh, the, the terms of the discussion that was had last night beyond what Kenny Gibson has uh, narrated in this chamber. I'm more than happy to ask the Justice Secretary to respond in detail on the particular point. Uh, more generally, uh, obviously, this is uh, a sensitive issue. It is obviously a controversial uh, issue. I think it is very important uh, that we respect and protect women's rights. I've spent a lifetime uh, as a committed feminist doing exactly that, but that we also uh, respect and protect trans rights and that we allow a proper uh, debate, as the government is seeking uh, to do with draft legislation, uh, to convince uh, those who have concerns about this that there is not uh, a tension uh, and there is not uh, an inevitable conflict uh, between women's rights and trans rights. And that is work that is underway and the government will continue to take that forward in a responsible and a sensitive manner. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Following yesterday's devastating news that Penminent Engineering in Dumfries has entered administration for the second time, what steps will the Scottish Government take to help secure the future of the company and these regionally significant, highly skilled manufacturing jobs? And can the First Minister assure my constituents that her Government will provide every possible support to employees and their families at this difficult time, particularly so soon after the festive period? First Minister. Yes, I, I will give that assurance. That is uh, how the government always seeks to operate in these uh, very difficult situations. And I want to uh, also take the opportunity uh, to express my concern about the administration of Penman uh, and obviously, of course, the impact that has on, as I understand it, the 44 uh, jobs that uh, are uh, immediately lost as a result of that. Uh, the government's immediate concern is the workforce and we will do all we can to support uh, them. Affected employees have already received information on PACE support. Arrangements, I understand, are underway for a PACE event to be held in Dumfries on uh, Monday, uh, the 20th of January, next Monday. Uh, Scottish Enterprise is also establishing contact with the administrators to provide whatever support it can uh, to help working closely of course with partners within the south of scotland economic partnership and i'll ask the economy secretary to make sure uh, that the member is kept fully updated 
And I ask to be followed by Alexander Stewart. <coughs> Presenting officer, it's almost three years since Millie Main died after contracting an infection from the water supply at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital campus. Unbelievably, Millie's parents were not told the true cause of her death at the time. The health board knew the water supply was not safe and posed a high risk of infections when the hospital was opened and they failed to follow protocols and didn't report Millie's death to the procurator fiscal. First Minister, the way Millie's family has been treated is nothing short of a disgrace. It's right that we have a wider public inquiry, but there must be a specific inquiry on the circumstances of Millie's death. In Millie's mum's, Kimberly's own words, the health board has let us down at every step of the way and kept us in the dark. We believe Millie would still be alive today if the managers had listened to all the warnings of infection risk when the hospital first opened. We have lost all faith in the health board and its leadership. We want answers about Millie's death so that no family has to go through this ordeal again. We are calling for a fatal accident inquiry to uncover the truth. First Minister, do you agree with her? Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, absolutely uh, sympathise uh, with Kimberly, uh, Millie's mum and her wider family. What they have gone through is completely unacceptable and uh, I think everybody's heart uh, is with them uh, at this time. It is precisely, of course, because we want to make sure that any answers uh, that Millie's family or any other family uh, feels that they have a right to and they do have a right to those answers it's because we want to make sure they get them that we have uh, taken the decision to establish uh, the public inquiry and I know Anna Sarwar has welcomed that um, in terms of the call for a fatal accident inquiry I can absolutely <coughs> understand uh, that call and, and sympathize with the reasons behind that obviously as I've, I've just been uh, saying in my exchange with Richard Leonard decisions on fatal accident inquiries are entirely for the law officers they're not for the Scottish Government but I'm sure the Lord Advocate will uh, listen carefully uh, to the representations that are being made by Millie's family uh, and respond in due course and hopefully as quickly as possible. Alexander Stewart followed by David Stewart. Thank you presiding officer. First Minister like me you will no doubt be appalled that the news that hundreds of elderly people have been mistreated by staff in care homes across Tayside and Fife in recent years. 939 complaints have been investigated and upheld by the Care Inspectorate. First Minister, everybody in Scotland has the right to safe, good quality and compassionate care which meets their needs and respects their rights. What urgent steps will the Scottish Government put in place to ensure that this kind of treatment is eradicated from our care sector? First Minister. Oh. Firstly, the vast majority of elderly people in our care homes uh, across the country get excellent care by dedicated members of staff, and I think it's really important that all of us uh, recognise that. Uh, the member is absolutely right that any elderly person who doesn't get that excellent standard of care is being let down. Uh, in terms of actions, the, the reason we have a care inspector is to make sure uh, that there is robust and rigorous investigation of any complaints, as well as general inspections of care homes uh, so the, the care inspector that has that job to do uh, when it does that job and when it finds failings we had uh, issues I think raised uh, in this regard last week uh, then the care inspector that makes recommendations and it is incumbent on care homes on local authorities and if there are recommendations uh, directed at the Scottish Government for those recommendations to be taken forward and uh, that is what I expect uh, to happen because every elderly uh, person in a care home we all have uh, or many of us have elderly relatives and we should always uh, consider these uh, matters from the perspective of the care we would want our own relatives to have and I think that is the standard all of us sh should expect to be upheld for everyone in a care home anywhere in Scotland. David Stewart, followed by Tom Mason. <coughs> David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be well aware of the concerns expressed this week by the leader of Murray Council about the severe cash shortfall in their local Scottish welfare fund. Frontline benefit staff say there's been a rise in the number of people feeling suicidal and of those with acute mental health and drug issues. Does the First Minister share my concerns and what comfort she can she give to the hard-pressed frontline staff in Murray and the highly vulnerable people they serve? Well, uh, of course, I, I do share uh, 
some of that concern. Uh, it is because we have a, a concern about the impact of uh, austerity, of welfare cuts on uh, many people across the country that this government uh, established the welfare fund and continues to fund uh, that vital support for uh, people who need it. It is under pressure in many parts of the country because of the increasing demand being brought about by uh, deep welfare cuts and the continuing effects of austerity. We are, uh, as members, including Dave Stewart, knows in uh, a budget process right now, and these are all matters that we will continue to consider very carefully. Uh, but in this area in particular, it is really important that we focus on the source of this problem. We will always do everything we can to mitigate the impact of these cuts, uh, but the sooner we get into a position in this parliament where we can uh, stop having a situation where the poorest in our society uh, are treated in this way uh, through welfare cuts, uh, the better. So let's uh, also focus on tackling the source uh, rather than focusing on what we can do to mitigate it, which of course we will always continue to do as far as we can. And Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. According to the latest statistics, 44% of chronic pain sufferers in the NHS Grampian waited longer than the 18-week target for their first pain clinic appointments. The patient group AFASAR has been trying to organise a meeting to discuss this with the Scottish Government since October, without success, saying that, and I quote, the lack of care Respect and compassion by Scottish Government is a national disgrace. In addition, the Health Secretary has cancelled her, her appearances at the last two meetings of the cross-party group on chronic pain, leaving patients from across the country without answers. With this in mind, will the First Minister take personal charge of this situation and make sure that patients get both their meeting with the Scottish Government, but more importantly, the improvement in treatment they de desperately de deserve and need? Mr. Minister. Look, I thank Tom Mason uh, for the question. I, I'm not um, aware, uh, well, I haven't been aware until he raised it about the meeting request. I'll certainly be happy to have that looked into. I'm sure the Health Secretary would be happy to, to meet uh, with any organisation uh, that wanted to discuss uh, these issues. Uh, the Health Secretary tells me she is due to meet with the co-conveners of the cross-party uh, group shortly, um, I think, in order to discuss these issues. More generally, of course, we have our waiting times improvement plan, uh, which not just on the issue of chronic pain, but across uh, the health service is targeted at ensuring uh, that we reduce waiting times and ensure that uh, people are treated within those targets. Thank you. Question number three, Alison Johnson. No means we stay in. We're members of the European Union. This is what Ruth Davidson told Patrick Harvey and the nation during a TV debate in 2014. Now we're a fortnight away from losing our status and rights as EU citizens. Our EU friends and neighbours here are fearing for their futures. Our children are denied the right to move, live, work and love in 27 other countries. We're denied the right to have a say in our future. Does the First Minister agree with me that the people of Scotland deserve so much better? And can she tell us how her government will use the powers it has to stand against this assault on our rights? First Minister. Well, yes, I agree that Scotland deserves so much better than a Conservative government ripping us out of the European yeah. Union against yeah. our will. Yeah. And I don't just believe that we deserve better, I believe we could have much better if we were an independent country able to cooperate in the European Union in our own right. The Scottish Government will use uh, all of the powers at our disposal to mitigate the impact of Brexit, as we have been doing, for example, to provide support and advice to European nationals who have been treated utterly shamefully uh, by this UK government and we will continue to look at every way in which we can do that. But of course Scotland deserves the right to decide its own future and there's a really fundamental, fundamental issue at stake right now in Scotland and it's not actually about whether or not Scotland should be independent, it's about who gets to decide. Should that be the Scottish people or should that be Westminster? And it's also about whether the outcome of the general election is respected in Scotland as the Tories rightly demand that it is respected elsewhere in the UK. Uh, the Conservatives, of course, uh, are running scared of Scotland having that choice. And I can understand why, but they will not stop it. Democracy denial will not prevail. But the longer the Tories and perhaps others in this chamber persevere with the attempt to deny democracy, the more certain it becomes that Scotland will be an independent country.
Alison Johnson. The First Minister will share my concerns that we'll no longer be able to rely on the EU for access to environmental justice. It's clear that Brexit is being used by the Tories to roll back on workers' rights and environmental standards. Let's not forget that the EU gave us so many of the protections we take for granted today. Sadly, the Tories have thrown out guarantees that these will be maintained in the Withdrawal Bill. They even used the Bill to grab further powers from this Scottish Parliament, all because they are desperate for a Trump trade deal. These actions are a clear statement of their intent. We in Scotland must do everything we can to protect people and our environment. Until we rejoin the EU as an independent nation, will the First Minister protect our access to environmental justice and establish Scotland's own environmental court? First Minister. Uh, we will absolutely uh, make sure that environmental standards, as far as we have control over it, are not in any way diminished. If anything, we want to go further. Uh, we absolutely do not want a race to the bottom. We are in the process, of course, right now of uh, considering and deciding how we replace the environmental governance that will be lost uh, from leaving the European Union. And of course, we listen carefully to the representations around the detail of that that are being uh, made. Uh, but this race to the bottom is a real concern. I met. Uh, as part of my uh, regular meetings with the STUC yesterday, they fear a race to the bottom on workers' rights. Uh, we could face a race to the bottom on uh, consumer protections as well as environmental protections on general standards of regulation. And, you know, the Tories are obviously intensely uncomfortable as this has been discussed right now, but there are Tories everywhere talking about the benefits of being Brexit or of Brexit are all about being able to reduce that regulatory protection. So these are real fears um, and we will do everything we can within our existing powers to protect Scotland against that. But the best way for Scotland to protect itself is to stop being at the mercy of Westminster governments, particularly Westminster Tory governments, and to have the right to choose a better future. Um, I'm reminded of the leaflet, uh, one of many leaflets on this issue that the Tories issued during the general election campaign. It said, uh, well, I think it was one of the last ones, on Thursday you will decide, they said to the Scottish people, whether or not there will be an independence referendum. The only way to stop it is to vote Scottish Conservative in Scotland. Well, Scotland <laughs> didn't vote Scottish Conservative. They put the issue on the ballot paper. They lost. It's time to give Scotland a chance to yeah. choose our own future. Some, uh, some further supplementary questions. Murdo Fraser to be followed by Claire Baker. Oh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The uh, 2014 Scottish Government's White Paper on Independence described the annual GERS report as, and I quote, the authoritative publication on Scotland's public finances. Given that that is the Scottish Government's view, why is the Finance Secretary now proposing an alternative set of propaganda figures <laughs> to be published alongside? On what data will these alternative figures be based and how much will this exercise in SNP spin cost the Scottish taxpayer? First Minister. Jairs, which the Scottish Government publishes every year, sets out the situation not under an independent yeah. Scotland, yeah. but under Westminster government. Yeah. So why would we set out different figures so that we can show what we can do differently yeah. in Scotland? Yeah. The different spending commitments that we for example, spending more to grow our economy, spending more to protect the most vulnerable and not spending money on new weapons of mass destruction on the River Clyde. These are the different choices we can make and it's one of the many reasons why the Tories are terrified of the prospect of giving Scotland the choice of independence because they know Scotland will choose to become independent. Claire Baker, to be followed by Angela Constance. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the fantastic news that MND Scotland, the Ewan Macdonald Centre and My Name Doddy Foundation launched a major MND drug trial yesterday, the biggest and most innovative trial the UK has ever seen. Two drugs are being tested as part of the MND SMART trial, but there is flexibility to run more treatments through this trial in the future. What support can the Scottish Government provide to make sure we keep discovering new candidate drugs to trial through the MND SMART programme? First Minister. Well, 
Firstly, uh, yesterday's news about these drug trials for MND uh, was fantastic, and I think everybody across the chamber clearly is of that view. Um, the Scottish Government has already met with uh, Doddy Weir, uh, and we will meet with others involved. Uh, we have a very good relationship uh, with MND Scotland, and they rightly keep pressure on the Scottish Government to do everything we can. So we look forward to continuing to have discussions about the support that the Scottish uh, Government can bring, as we have done in the past, to make sure we are doing everything we can uh, as a country to get to a position as quickly as possible where we uh, perhaps have a cure uh, for this cruelest uh, of diseases and I hope members across the chamber will support those efforts as I'm sure uh, everybody does. Angela Constance to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, President Officer. What's the First Minister's message to Labour supporters who will be rightly mortified by the ill-considered and frankly offensive leadership pitch by Labour's Lisa Nandy, who wants to set up an international commission against Scottish independence, presumably so the UK can deal with Scotland as Spain has dealt with Catalonia. Surely this is a potentially inflammatory and undemocratic position to take. Here, here. Well, I think Angela Constance is right to raise this issue. I I'm actually going to try to give Lisa Nandy the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to assume, hard though it may be to believe, that when she made the comments that she did, she hadn't paid attention to what has actually happened in Catalonia in recent times. Because if she had, she would surely not have suggested that there are any positive lessons uh, at all to be learned from that. So perhaps Lisa Nandy should take the opportunity to clarify exactly what she did mean, recognise the concern that it has caused, and perhaps even apologise for that. Yeah. Andy Whiteman to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Andy Whiteman. General and the Accounts Commission have today criticised the city region deals for a lack of aims and objectives. What will the First Minister do to ensure that the billions that are committed to these directionless deals contribute to the transition to a zero carbon economy rather than funding retrograde proposals like the 120 million flyover at Sheriff Hall in Edinburgh? First Minister. Uh, well, we uh, welcome today's report because uh, it also highlights the positive effect that city, region and growth deals are having across Scotland, strengthening relationships between councils, government business, universities and a range of other partners. Of course, we will pay close attention uh, to recommendations in that report so that we make sure uh, the governance and the accountability is as strong as everybody would want it to be. Of course, UK government are partners in uh, city, region and growth deals. Uh, the audit uh, Scotland, of course, uh, didn't, I don't believe, direct recommendations that it is because it's out with its remit, but they are uh, partners in that. But, you know, I do think it's really important to recognise the benefit that these deals are bringing and will bring to communities across uh, Scotland, which is why the Scottish Government is such a substantial funder of them. Mike Rumbles. The First Minister is fond of talking about democratic mandates, but does she, the First Minister not recognise that last month 55% of Scottish voters, Scottish voters voted for candidates opposed to another independence referendum. And that, you want to listen. You want to listen to the, you want to listen to the Scottish voters. And that level of opposition. Order. Let's hear the question, please. That level of opposition has not changed one iota since 2014. First Minister. Well, Mike Rumbles might not have intended this, but he's actually just made an argument for having a referendum uh, so that we can put that to the test. Uh, we stood, we stood on, a mandate, uh, on a mandate and on a platform to offer an independence referendum and give people the choice. We scored a higher percentage of the vote in Scotland than the Tories did UK wide, but they still claim the election result is a mandate for their form of Brexit. So if Mike Rumbles is confident in his view, I suspect he isn't, but he, if he is confident in his view uh, that Scotland still doesn't want independence, then have the courage of your convictions and put it to the test. Of course, the Liberal Democrats were perfectly happy uh, to propose and argue for a second referendum on EU membership. So I think they should perhaps... I think uh, they should uh, perhaps look at the consistency of their own position uh, before they stand up and ask questions of that nature in this chamber. 
Question four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what impact ending Erasmus scheme will have on Scotland's further and higher educational institutions. First Minister. Well, Scotland does exceptionally well uh, from Erasmus+. Plus. Proportionally, more students from Scotland study abroad under the programme than students from England, Wales and Northern Ireland, while at the same time, proportionally more Erasmus students from across Europe come to Scotland than to anywhere else in the UK. Ending our participation in Erasmus would be a huge step backwards. It would be a disaster for our universities, whose campuses enjoy the diversity and internationalism that the programme brings. It would be a disaster for our students, uh, the ability to study abroad, learn about new cultures, develop self-confidence and improve language skills are things that should be championed. They certainly should not be abandoned. Claire Adamson. Thank the First Minister for her answer. And not surprising Scotland does so well, given it was Madame McCoy's Winnie Ewing, who was instrumental in establishing the Erasmus programme. But Boris Johnson has claimed that Erasmus will continue as normal. Cold comfort, given that his party voted against the scheme during the progress of the EU withdrawal bill. Does the First Minister agree that Scotland and our European neighbours reap huge cultural and educational benefits from Erasmus and it's incumbent on the UK Government to legally guarantee this without delay? Uh, yes, I do agree. And I, I think if uh, the Tories' uh, assurances around uh, Erasmus were worth anything, then they wouldn't have voted against uh, legally protecting the scheme when they had the opportunity uh, last week. Uh, safeguarding the future of our participation in Erasmus is essential. I believe it has broad support across uh, the whole of the country, including in this chamber and it's important to note that the programme supports not just students but schools, youth groups, sports clubs, providing them with the opportunity to learn uh, and grow from time spent abroad. Uh, that's why the Scottish Government continues uh, to put it to the UK Government that they must urgently confirm their intention to participate and set out exactly how that will operate. Uh, of course our preference is for the whole of the UK to remain associated but in the event that the UK Government does uh, choose to abandon the programme uh, we are also considering what routes are available that would allow Scotland to remain a member. Question 5, Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister, what measures the Scottish Government is taking to address the reported crisis in wild salmon stocks? First Minister. It is uh, Scotland's year of coasts and waters. Last week, the Scottish Government announced uh, £750,000 of funding for a project to investigate the migration of wild salmon on the west coast. This builds on an ongoing programme of research and monitoring, which includes the Murray Firth tracking project and will help to develop a body of evidence on the complex challenges salmon stocks face across Scotland. In addition, we've committed to the development of a wild salmon strategy in the programme for government and working with key stakeholders. We will continue to do everything possible to safeguard the future of Scotland's wild salmon. Peter Chapman. I thank the First Minister. Minister for that answer and I ref reflect at the start of the new salmon season how I iconic wild salmon are to Scotland's history and culture and that angling still supports many jobs in rural Scotland and I welcome the measures such as the £750,000 grant to help track salmon on their journey across the North Atlantic which the First Minister mentioned and this will hopefully lead to a better understanding of the challenges salmon face in their migratory routes Wild Atlantic, Atlantic salmon are a powerful symbol of the health of our rivers and oceans. And the first task is to make this a conservation issue of the highest importance. And will the First Minister commit to working across international borders to ensure we do not lose this valuable species? And does she believe that the Rural Economy Committee's recommendations on, aqu on aquaculture are being actioned fast enough to ensure that salmon farms can continue to be environmentally sustainable as they continue to expand. First Minister. Uh, well, actually, I actually agree with uh, much of the thrust of that question. Of course, this is a challenge uh, across the North Atlantic. It's not uh, unique uh, to Scotland, uh, but it is important that we take the actions that I have already uh, set out. I agree very much. Uh, with the member in terms of his comments about the iconic uh, status and, and nature of wild salmon in Scotland, but also about his 
uh, economic points, angling makes a, a key contribution to many rural areas across Scotland. Uh, specifically on the conservation uh, point, uh, we already have a rigorous regime of statutory salmon conservation orders, uh, which are refreshed annually. The 2020 conservation assessment uh, takes account of the most recently available catch return statistics in assessing uh, the status for uh, a number of uh, rivers and river groupings. Uh, regulations for the 2020 season were laid uh, in December and will be considered by the committee. And of course, beyond that, uh, more broadly, um, we've continued the ban on coastal netting of wild salmon uh, around Scotland, which was introduced in 2016, and will continue to consider carefully any recommendations that the committee makes. Thank you. Question number six, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish government's, government's response is to reports that Police Scotland have spent £11.6 million pounds in compensation over the last five years. Well, civil claims arise out of a wide variety of situations and are resolved according to their own particular facts and circumstances. The Scottish Government expects all public bodies to conduct litigation with careful regard to the public purse. It is, of course, for Police Scotland to determine the level of compensation payments. These are dealt with individually on a case-by-case -case basis and with a view to securing best value. James Kelly. Thank the First Minister for that answer. The fact that police compensation claims have doubled between 2015 and 2019 demonstrates the scale of problems throughout Police Scotland. On the front line, a recent survey revealed that nearly three quarters of officers had gone to work feeling physically unwell and more than a third faced mental health challenges. And on resigning as chair of the SPA, Susan Deacon described uh, governance and accountability in policing is fundamentally flawed. So will the First Minister agree that the Scottish Government should apologise to frontline officers for the disarray that currently exists in their working environment and will she urgently set out what steps the Government will take to deal with the serious structural problems within Police Scotland? First Minister. Um, well, I, I simply don't accept or agree with the the general premise of that question um, and uh, I certainly don't agree with James Kelly's characterisation of it. Uh, this government has worked and will continue to work to support uh, the police service and frontline police officers. We've uh, protected the thousand additional uh, police officers that we came into office in 2007 with a commitment around and of course uh, that's over a similar period when police numbers elsewhere in the UK uh, plummeted. We're also uh, protecting the revenue budget in real terms for the police service over the lifetime of this parliament and of course all of these issues uh, will be relevant in the ongoing uh, budget process we have and I've set them out in this chamber in recent weeks in response I think to Willie Rennie taking a number of actions as are the police taking a number of actions to support the mental health and well-being of police officers. There have been uh, reviews uh, by committees of this parliament, of course, into the, the structure and governance of the police and improvements made, um, and they uh, continue to be made. So I actually uh, think that our police service does a, a tremendously good job and they deserve our deep gratitude for that. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to a member's business debate in the name of Lewis MacDonald on sustainable development goals in Scotland on target for 2030, but we're going to just suspend shortly to allow members, ministers and the gallery to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>